After a 5-0 start to its season, Maryland football will lose four straight before ending the season 7-5. We'll take a look at what went right and wrong in the Terps season and preview the bowl matchup ahead, coming up on this edition of the Left Bench in Focus. Some guys are shooters, some guys are scorers, and he got that scoring mentality. So it's kind of just trusting myself and uh, knowing the game plan. Welcome back to the Left Bench In Focus, presented by Terrapin Sports Central. I'm Andrew McBride, that's Ben Wolf, and Ben, I'm excited to talk about this team just as much as I am to be back behind the desk with you. Yeah, Andrew, it's crazy to believe that this is our final show of the year, but we can't waste any more time to wrap up the Terps 2023 campaign. And what better way to start than the goal game down south? Yup, the Terps will be headed to Nashville, Tennessee, to take on Auburn in the Trans-Perfect Music City Bowl at the Tennessee Titans Nissan Stadium. Auburn wrapped up its regular season posting a 6-6 record with a crushing loss to Alabama on a game-winning 31-yard touchdown by Isaiah Bond on the 10-year anniversary of the Kick 6. Maryland has played Auburn three times, with the last time being in 1983. The Tigers control the all-time record 2-1 and will be the Terps' first SEC opponent since 2002. The Terps look to even that record at two apiece and win three straight bowl games in three consecutive seasons for the first time in program history. The Music City Bowl is slated for a 2 p.m. kickoff on December 30th and will be broadcasted on ABC. Um, obviously, we're really excited to be selected to play in the Trans Perfect Music City Bowl. I know our players, our program is really looking forward to playing inside of a great uh, football venue, the uh, Nissan Stadium, and a great football city down here in Nashville. Um, you know, we're thrilled to have a, 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 an opponent, uh, the quality opponent, like an SEC team, like Auburn. Um, I know Turk Nation is ready to come and support us down there. A great opportunity. To preview the bowl game some more and break down their season, we're happy to be joined by the Testudo boys, Emmett Siegel and Andrew Chodas. Boys, thanks for being here as always. Always, thank you for having, thank us. having us. So guys, I wanted to start off by taking a look at the offense. With Talia Tagovailo departing after the 2023 season, who do you think Maryland will turn to to lead the offense next year? Do you think they'll hit the transfer portal, bring in a new recruit, or stick with who they have on the roster right now? Uh, I think as it stands right now, they're probably not totally sure. Um, if I were to be putting my money on it, I would probably guess that it'll be someone who's not on the roster right now, probably a transfer, but we don't know who that would be yet because we're still early. The transfer portal just opened recently. Um, of the two guys that they have coming back that I would expect to maybe compete for that job if they stay in-house, that would be Billy Edwards and Cam Edge, uh, two younger guys who have gotten a little bit of playing time, Billy more than Cam. Um, but if I were to be guessing, I would probably lean on the side that it's someone that will be a transfer from a different school. Yeah, for sure. Completely agree. I think Billy Edwards, he's shown a lot of potential, I think, especially in the running game. He went a span the last two games, I think, at four or five touchdowns. But I would agree with Emmett. They're probably going to lean towards somebody in the transfer portal to try to replace some of Talia Tagovailoa. And, guys, I mean, it was so tough watching such a promising season just go like that and just diminish. So what did the Terps get away from or start doing wrong in the second half of the season that led to so many unfortunate losses? Yeah, I think the Ohio State loss, I think, you know, having that lead up, up 10 nothing, and then obviously lose my 20 points, I think that was really demoralizing for the team. Obviously, they then go on, they, they lose to Illinois, they lose to Northwestern. Those are just a few back-breaking losses, and I think it was really hard for them to turn the corner after that. And there was a point, I know, where me and Emmett were talking, you know, they were sitting at 5-4, and four, it's like, are they going to make a bowl game? Are they even going to win? their game, but they were able to salvage a winning season, you know, with two wins against Nebraska and then at Rutgers. But I think ultimately this season renders a pretty big disappointment. Yeah, I mean, during that stretch, they started to kind of get away from what made them successful the year before, which was their defense was giving up a lot of points. Their offense wasn't necessarily working as well as it should have, especially in the passing game, the running game. They couldn't really get going. Um, so it was just kind of a confluence of things that led to that losing streak. But like Andrew said, they eventually were able to figure it out and end the season on a positive note. Well, now taking a look at the bowl game, Maryland has a chance to make history winning three bowl games in three consecutive seasons, but the Terps still haven't had that statement Big Ten win over one of the powerhouse teams. Do you think a win this December will have an impact on making Maryland a more attractive destination for recruits? I think it could, uh, not necessarily because it'll attract a ton of recruits this year, because I believe that the bowl game is after the early signing period begins, which is when a lot of Maryland's recruits will commit. 
But, uh, but I do think that you know, winning eight games for consecutive years, like you said, winning three straight bowl games is uh, kind of a vision that Mike Loxley had when he arrived, and kind of you're starting to see it come together. And just being able to sell that vision with tangible results is always really valuable. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how much it will impact recruiting per se, because I, I think that you know the past few years they've kind of established they're kind of a middle of the pack Big Ten team, and like you mentioned, those losses to Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, they still don't have a win against a ranked Big Ten opponent. So I think you know when recruits look at that, they're like, well, wouldn't I rather go to one of those those three schools, especially with teams like Oregon and Washington now coming in to the Big Ten? But it can't hurt, right? Obviously, having three eight win seasons, it's still an important goal that Mike Lochte was able to reach, and especially against an SEC team like Auburn, I think that does say something. All right, last question here for you guys: Seven Terps have already announced that they're entering the transfer portal this season, including impact players like Corey Thatcher and Jayshon Barham. So. What players do Loxley and his staff look to next season to fill all the empty holes left by these departing players? Andrew? Uh, well, I think if you look at the, the, the two main guys who left, right, you mentioned Jay Sean Barham and Corey Dicious. Jay Sean Barham, obviously a huge blow to the team. He was one of their defensive leaders. But I think they're definitely, you have to lean, I mean, Loxley's been very big on trying to get veterans from the transfer portal. I think that's somewhere where he's going to lean a lot. Some, young, some transfers like Donnell Brown really came onto the scene. Uh, this past season, um, Riyad Wilmot. I mean, there's definitely a bunch of guys, but I think ultimately it's going to be, it, it's going to be really hard to replace Jason Barham, in my opinion. And then moving on to Corey Dicious, I think they were looking maybe towards Rico Walker, a freshman. He just entered the transfer portal as well. Preston Howard is a guy who had some, you know, some some nice flashes this season. Maybe he can make an impact. Yeah, um, I think I echo what Andrew said, and also adding uh, at the tight end position, you have uh, Preston Howard. Like you said, you also have Dylan Wade who was a freshman who got a little bit of playing time this year. Um, and tight end is a position that they were able to have you know, some numbers at. They got some other guys that didn't play as much. And then at linebacker, they've always kind of been by committee, even though Barham was such an impact player. You have you know, guys like Ruben Hippolyte and uh, some, some younger players, some freshmen that uh, got playing time, like, like an Andrew Harris, uh, say, and maybe uh, you know, some of the other guys they brought in uh, last year. So it's kind of a numbers situation where they will probably figure it out. And I don't expect a ton of decline in production from those positions specifically. But the biggest one, like you said earlier, is that Talia Tungvalo is leaving. So that leaves a ton of questions on the offensive side of the ball. Awesome. Well, that's all the time we have. Emma and Andrew, thank you so much again for coming on. Thank of you. course. Thanks for having us. Um, but you guys will be back in a bit to play a game against our oh, Absolutely. Can't wait. <laughs> the biggest news from Maryland right now, the transfer portal. Once it opened, the Terps were quick to make their announcements. As of right now, Maryland has seven players who will transfer from the school after the season. Arguably the biggest loss to the portal for the Terps so far is linebacker Jayshon Barham. The former four-star is huge for the Terps this season. He was second on the team in sacks and first in QB hits, and he racked up 37 tackles. Another huge loss is tight end Corey Deitches. He led Big Ten tight ends in receptions with 49. This is a massive blow for the Terps offense, and they now have to look to freshman tight ends Preston Howard and Dylan Wade to fill the shoes of Deitches. Other Terps that entered the portal were Rico Walker, Gavin Gibson, Corey Coley Jr., Tamarcus Cooley, and Jacavion Nonar. Coach Loxley said that the 2023 season came to a close with the Rutgers game, which means it's a perfect time for us to take a look at the state of the program. Our Nathan Schwartz is in Studio B to break down how this team has fared over the last couple of years. Nate? Thanks, guys. It's no secret that Maryland football was not in a good place when Michael Loxley took over, but this program has made immense strides over the last five years. Loxley became Maryland's head coach in December of 2018, and the program has only been trending upward since. After a rough 2019 and the COVID year in 2020, the Terps found their stride in 2021, going 7-6 and six and winning the pinstripe bowl over Virginia Tech, Maryland's first bowl game win since I was in second grade. And not only was that a historic day for the program, but it marked the start of something special in the shell. Loxley led Maryland to eight wins in 2022 and a second straight bowl win, this time over NC State in the Duke's Mayo Bowl. This season, Maryland kept pace with its success, going seven and five. Now let's face it, the Terps could have had eight or nine wins this year, but seven wins and a third straight bowl appearance is another building block for this program. Loxley is only the fourth coach in program history to make it to three straight bowls, and he can be the first Maryland coach to win each of those games, which speaks dividends to the impact this senior class and Loxley have made on the Maryland football program. Now, while three straight bowl games is a phenomenal accomplishment, there is still one thing that the Terps struggle with, and that's winning the big game. 
It's been something that has haunted this program for quite some time. And over the last five years, there's only one game, other than the bowl games, of course, that is considered a big win. You got to go to 2020 when it was a 35 to 19 win in Happy Valley over Penn State. Other than that, it's been loss after loss after loss against ranked opponents. And it's not like some of these haven't been close games. You can look back to early October when Maryland led Ohio State in the third quarter and only lost by one score to Michigan in each of the last two seasons. So it's clear that Maryland will put up a fight in these games. But when it's mattered most, the Terps haven't been able to close them out, something that will only get more tough with conference realignment. And so we've reached the question everyone wants to know. Where does Maryland go from here? And I'll tell you what, Loxley has a lot of work to do. The departures are stacking up on each other at a rapid rate, highlighted by Talia Tungvaloa, who has said the Music City Bowl will be his last game at Maryland. The Terps have Billy Edwards Jr. and Cam Edge on the roster, but with a plethora of QBs in the transfer portal, it's going to be a complete toss-up on who will be under center for Maryland in 2024. But it's not just the quarterback that Maryland has to replace, pretty much the entire DB room will be gone. Tar Heap still just declared for the draft. Bo Braid and Jaquan Shepard will likely soon follow, and three key backups enter the transfer portal. And to pile it on, Maryland's top recruit from 2022, Jay Sean Barham, plus starting tight end Corey Dyke, just won't be in College Park next season either. So to put it lightly, the Turfs will look completely different next year, and they're going to have to be aggressive in the portal if they want to make a fourth straight bowl game. And guys, I don't know what's in store for the future of this program, but for right now, Loxley has turned this team into a constant bowl contender, and that's something important to note. Back to you guys. Thanks, Nate. And Ben, regardless of how this team looks with all these transfers next year, I think Terps fans should be confident in Loxley's ability to get them to another bowl game. Yeah, I think if Loxley's just able to maintain that winning culture in the locker room, I don't see why the new players won't be able to pick up where Maryland's left off these past few years. But if they want to conquer that Big Ten gauntlet, they're going to have to kick it into the next level. That's right. Now stick around because when we come back, we'll take a look at Talia Tagovailoa's legacy in a Maryland uniform. We'll also be bringing on some student football reporters for a trivia game and crown our players of the year. Don't go anywhere. Jason, let's go see your room. If you need to do something to feel okay to drive, you're not okay to drive. Don't drive buzzed. Uh, fue pintor más de 30 años. Cuando Mario me dijo que tenía problemas en el trabajo, que se le estaban olvidando las cosas, fue difícil. Yo le di a la gente que le diga a su familia lo que está pasando con él. Y quiero que me apoyen, que me entiendan y que me quieran. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Left Engine Focus brought to you by Terrapin Sports Central. I'm Ben Wolf, alongside Andrew McBride. And Andrew, it's not just the end of Maryland football season, but it's also the end of a special players as well. You're right on that, Ben. So of course we can't have a football and focus show without highlighting, if not the biggest shift for this program, the arrival of quarterback Talia Tagabailoa. TSC's Drew Owens has more on his Maryland legacy. Drew? That's right, guys. As football season is coming to a close, so is Talia Tungvaloa's career here at Maryland. So, why not dive into his unforgettable time in College Park? Tungvaloa transferred to Maryland during the pandemic in 2020. Before that, he was the backup quarterback at Alabama to now Patriots quarterback Mac Jones and to none other than his brother, Tua. During 2020, Tungvaloa started in four of the five games Maryland played. In those games, Maryland won 2-2 two two with the win over Minnesota and snapping the five-game losing streak to Penn State. In his first year, Tagovailoa threw for 1,011 yards, had seven touchdowns and seven interceptions. 
He also ranked top five in the Big Ten in yards per completion, passing efficiency, yards per pass attempt, passing yards per game, and total offense. Tagovailoa showed a huge improvement in his second year at Maryland. He threw for his most yards at Maryland, 3,860, had his most touchdowns with 26, and had 11 interceptions. His completion percentage was at an all-time high that season with 69.2%. Oh, and he had, he had led Maryland to his first winning season since joining the Big Ten in 2014. The Terps earned their first bowl bid since 2016 and won that game. It was the first bowl game win for the program since 2010. And of course, Tonga Bailoa was named the MVP. That year, he broke the single-season completion record set by former Maryland quarterback John Kaleo against Michigan. Then he went to break the single-season passing yards record in the win against Rutgers. Tagovailoa's also tied Milanovic's record for single-season touchdowns in the 2021 Pinstripe Bowl game against Virginia Tech. Talk about a season of breaking records for the QB. In 2022, Tagovailoa had a bit of a hiccup mid-season after a knee injury took him out of the game. But that still didn't stop him from doing what he does best, adding his name in the record books. That year, he became Maryland's all-time leading passer he threw for 3,008 yards, had 18 touchdowns, and eight interceptions. Tungvaluwa led Maryland to its second consecutive bowl game, this time the Duke's Mayo Bowl in North Carolina. He led the Terps to another eight-win season with a win over NC State 16-12. On January 18th, Tungvaluwa announced that he will be coming back to Maryland to play in his last season. He threw for 3,377 yards, had 25 touchdown ends and 11 interceptions this year. His career high came in week five against Indiana, where he threw five touchdowns on 352 passing yards and added a rushing score. He ended the year seven and five and led Maryland to its third straight bowl game. They'll face Auburn on December 30th in the Transperfect Music City Bowl in Nashville. Throughout his time at Maryland, the all-time QB has been named to multiple Big Ten Conference awards, but his most renowned award was the one he broke in the most recent game against Rutgers, where he became the all-time Big Ten passing yards leader, surpassing Purdue's Curtis Painter. Tugvailoa ends his career at Maryland with 11,256 total yards, 76 touchdowns, and 37 interceptions. And guys, even though there's still a bowl game left to be played, I think everyone can agree that Tugvailoa has left a lasting mark on this program and gave Maryland fans a few amazing years they hadn't seen in a long time. Back to you. Thanks, Drew. And Ben, Talia was such a special quarterback and someone that Terps fans should be thankful for because who knows when the Maryland program will have a quarterback as prolific as him again. Yeah, he truly changed the trajectory of Maryland football program and definitely cemented his legacy here in College Park. We're, we're now joined by some of our great student reporters here. We're going to play a fun trivia game with them on Maryland season and really test their knowledge of the team. So we've got two teams, the TSC video reporters on the right Ricky Podgorski, Nathan Schwartz, Alex Gary, and Jonas Evans. And then we've got some from the other outlets, Kira Bruno, Emmett Siegel, and Andrew Chodas for Testudo Times. And then last but certainly not least, Brandon Schwartzberg for the Diamondback. All right, guys, I'm excited. You guys ready? Yes. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Let's All right. Do it. Let's do it. So first question. Talia leads all Maryland quarterbacks in all-time passing yards. Who is second on that list? Oh, no. Second all-time passing yard leader. That's not Talia. So who's behind Talia in passing okay. yards? Yeah. Is that all-time? I'm just remembering this Maryland. name. Oh, is this Maryland? Mm. Oh, <laughs> oh wait, I thought we. Yeah, yeah I thought this is the big time. Yeah, I don't have an answer. Oh, oh god. I don't. No idea. Is it? Um, can go on all I'm gonna. Oh, take, yeah, take it, Brandon. I'm take gonna it. take a gander. Dude. Boomer Esiason. No. No way, it's nope. Boomer Esiason. Boomer Esiason. Wait, I can't. Is that right? Were we correct? No. Oh, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. get a chance to steal? Fort and Schlager. No. No. No way. No chance. Can we give you guys a hint here? Hold on, they're telling the correct answer now. Go ahead, guys. What is it? We have a hint for you guys. Can we give it to you? Yeah, you guys want a hint? Yeah, we'll take a hint. All right. He played on Maryland from 1992 to 1995. He played on Maryland through 1990 through 1995. Whoa. No, 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 no. Anyway, while we figure it out, <laughs> take a look at the Maroon team over here. <laughs> yeah, the video yeah, reporters. Yeah, yeah. Repping the Maroon quarters. Yeah, Maroon four, as I like to call them. Maroon four. Yeah. What's his last, last name? name? I don't know his last name. Oh my god. I don't know his last name. <laughs> Anybody got an answer? Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. 
I say go for it. Just go for it. 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 I don't know if this is um, final guys here. I don't know if this is how you say his last name. Is it Scott Milanovic? Yes. Yep. Nathan got it. Yeah. Yeah. We knew. We we had one some zero TSC. All right, you guys ready for question two? Let's go. Let's go. All right, one, one for the good guys. One right. for the good guys. Yeah. Yeah. Let's keep it up, TSC. All right, next but one. We'll see if the other porters. All right, question two. Ty Fellon had three receiving touchdowns against Indiana this season, which is tied for second for the most in a single game. Who holds the Maryland record for the most touchdown receptions in a single game? Are we getting one answer for a tough one? It's tough. It's really Brady. touching on Maryland knowledge. Tory Smith. Yes, oh. two for Correct. the good guys. Yes. Yes. Two. Yes. Didn't expect anything else. I don't know yeah. what else I can say. Here another quarter. has got to pick it up. Yeah. You know, Nathan Nathan was confident. Yeah, in the yes. he was. They're, they're carrying the load. All right, yes. you guys ready for the third and final question? Wait, let's do. We'll see how this turns We'll do whoever wins this one wins the whole I like oh. it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Let's, let's okay. do the third question. All right, third All right. question. Mike Loxley has led the Terps to three straight bowl appearances. Who was the last head coach to do that prior to Loxley? Ralph Friedman. Did you get it? Ralph Friedman. What is Ralph Friedman? <laughs> yes. 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 All right. At least you know. At least. At least. Look, thank you guys so much for playing our trivia game. Good effort. It took a while on the first one, but. Uh, Great energy, great having you guys uh, on. Didn't expect anything else, Ben. We knew our TSC reporters were going to be TSC, TSC that's against that's the world. Yeah. 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 Really, it's yeah. about how you finish, not how you start. Well, that's we true. started with three quarters until we finished. Okay, but we so, had that second. One. Exactly. You had that. I did. But you didn't we'll call that one get, a tie. You didn't get it. You had it. Congrats. You didn't get the points, unfortunately. Game is game. We need to bring this back because maybe for basketball season or something. I agree we should bring it back. Uh, we didn't expect anything else from our TSC reporters. You know, we, we knew they would carry the load. Me neither. It was a good game. I think we should maybe even extend it more. Maybe in six questions, give, give both should. sides a good chance. Something like that. Yeah. But proud of our TSC guys. Yeah. Great job, and thanks for coming on, guys. With the season coming to an end, it's time to hand out some of our end of the year awards. First up, our Offensive Player of the Year. Who will also be on top of the list besides quarterback Talia Tagovailoa? Agavaloa posted another standout season. He broke the Big Ten all-time passing record in the game against Rutgers, surpassing former Purdue quarterback Curtis Painter's record of 11,163 yards. Tagavaloa put up 3,377 yards and 25 touchdowns this season, giving him a total of 11,193 yards and 76 touchdowns in his career as a Terp. Congrats to Talia on leaving a legacy of a lifetime and being named our Offensive Player of the Year. Continuing with statistical leaders and someone who just declared for the NFL Draft, our Defensive Player of the Year is Tarheeb Still. Still was a ball hawk for the Terps this season, leading the team and ranking fifth in the nation with five interceptions, alongside 45 total tackles. Still ranks third in the country, averaging .5 interceptions per game. He's also been recognized by the Big Ten for his performance, being named to the All Big Ten second team. Still has been a crucial player and leader for the Maryland secondary his whole career at Maryland. Congrats to Tarheeb on being named our Defensive Player of the Year. And finally, earning our Special Teams Player of the Year is freshman kick returner Braden Wyslowski. Wyslowski returned 15 kickoffs for 353 yards this season. The most notable, though, was his 98-yard touchdown return against Virginia. The Terps were down 14 early before Wyslowski delivered the spark the team needed. Congrats to Braden on being crowned our Special Teams Player of the Year. Now let's look at the big leagues for our Pro Terp of the Year. We just had to go with DJ Moore. After getting traded to Chicago from Carolina before the 2023 NFL Draft, Moore has taken that next step, establishing himself as a true number one receiver. So far this season, Moore has hauled in 70 receptions for 1,003 yards and six touchdowns. He had a monster game against the Commanders in Week 8, where he re recorded eight catches for 230 yards with not one, not two, but three touchdowns. Congrats to DJ Moore on being crowned our Pro Terp of the Year. All right, you know what time it is. It's towards the end of the show, so it's time for our top players of the year that we picked. Ben, go ahead and get us going. All right, here we go. At number five, we got Jay Sean Barham's interception against Michigan. Look at him reading G JJ McCarthy's eyes and making the grab. 
Here we go, number four, Talia's sidearm pass to Preston Howard against Rutgers. He coach Chris Collinsworth here. He's got a little bit of Patrick Mahomes in him. Here at number three, we got Preston Howard's hurdle over a Virginia defender. You know, Andrew, I've made hurdles like that, except I've done it in my dreams. Yeah, I was gonna say. Number two, here we go. We've got Braden Wistowski's 98-yard kickoff return, our special teams player of the year. Huge, huge play for Maryland in that blackout game. And who else at number one but Talia Tagovailoa, record-breaking pass to Jason Jones. Talia has had an amazing career in a Maryland uniform, as has cemented himself as the Big Ten passing leader. Well, that'll do it for this edition of the Left Bench in Focus. Thank you so much for following along all of our coverage and watching our shows this year. In the meantime, you can keep up with all of Terrapin Sports Central's coverage on X, Instagram, and YouTube online at TerrapinSportsCentral.com. Everyone at TSC wishes you a happy holidays, and we'll see you next year.